In the shadowed annals of human history, a chilling narrative persists, whispered in hushed tones, cloaked in fear and mystery. The tale of demonic possession. A macabre dance between the living and the beyond, a terrifying fusion of the mortal and the supernatural. Throughout time, these harrowing accounts have shaken the very foundations of civilization, evoking our deepest fears and challenging our understanding of the spiritual realm. For centuries, the Catholic Church has been the gatekeeper of these stories, holding the keys to a world where malevolent entities lay claim to innocent souls. In the heart of 17th century France, a haunting spectre descended upon the quiet town of Loudon. A series of demonic possessions took hold of the Ursuline nuns, spinning a web of horror that would scar the pages of history. This was only the beginning, a grim prologue to a saga that spanned continents and centuries. From the tortured soul of Anna Eklund, encased in a demonic grip for over two decades, to the horrifying transformation of Michel Colombier, known as the Beast of Jersey, each story presents a portrait of fear that tests the boundaries of belief. Then, in the confines of a simple Bavarian home, the harrowing plight of Annalisa Michel brought the terror of possession to the modern age, stirring a contentious debate about faith, medicine, and the line between the divine and the mental. Meanwhile, in Pennsylvania, the Smurl family's life was turned upside down as they found themselves at the center of a chilling siege, their home a battleground between light and darkness. <laughs> Finally, we delve into the gripping tale that inspired the infamous The Exorcist, the story of a young boy, known only as Roland Doe, whose life became the stage for another worldly power. These six stories, shrouded in fear and mystery, reveal a haunting journey through the ages of possession, presenting us with a stark exploration of our deepest fears. The true horror lies not only in the supernatural, but also in our relentless pursuit to understand the unimaginable. Let the darkness unfold as we venture into the terrifying realm of the possessed. The tale of demonic possession is as old as civilization itself, a ghastly thread that weaves through the tapestry of human history. From ancient Mesopotamian clay tablets etching tales of demonic interference to the sacred texts of major religions, the narrative of unseen evil forces has found a home. Ancient lore tells of shadows that creep unseen, spirits with insidious intent whose sole purpose is to seize control of the living, to twist their bodies and minds into grotesque marionettes. The horror does not stem merely from the malignant entities, but from the chilling transformation of the innocent, their humanity gradually eclipsed by an unseen force of pure malevolence. In this sphere of the sinister and the supernatural, the Catholic Church has long stood as a bulwark against the darkness. This sacred institution, steeped in centuries of tradition and doctrine, holds firm in its belief in the existence of demonic entities, forces of evil that defy the natural order, seeking to usurp God's creation. The Church's stance on possession is unequivocal, a chilling acknowledgement of a war waged in the spiritual realm, one that occasionally spills into our reality. But the Church also proffers a weapon against this spiritual warfare, the rite of exorcism, an ancient liturgical practice designed to expel demonic entities. Endowed with the authority of Christ himself, exorcists serve as spiritual warriors, standing on the front line of this cosmic battle. Yet every battle has casualties, and these confrontations often leave indelible scars on both the possessed and those daring to intervene. This is the chilling backdrop against which our tales of possession unfold. A reality where the spiritual and physical worlds intertwine cloaked in fear, and they're unknown. In the dark recesses of our minds, 
we quiver at the thought of demonic possession, of an invisible malevolence that has the power to rip away our control and thrust us into a horrifying dance of darkness. What ignites this cold dread within us? Is it the thought of losing ourselves, becoming mere puppets in the grip of unseen forces? Or is it the terrifying realization of a lurking malevolence in the corners of our existence, an absolute evil that shares our world unseen? The chill of these stories resonates within us, breaking the comfort of the reality we know and exposing us to the possibility that we may not be alone in our world and that what lurks unseen may not always be benign. We set out on this journey not merely to scare, but to delve deeper, to plunge into the haunting mysteries that have puzzled humanity for centuries. It's an invitation to step onto a terrifying path, to gaze into the shadowy corners of history and spirituality, and to question what we know and probe the depths of what we fear. Through the exploration of these six historical cases, we aspire to shed light on the unknown, to unravel the practices of the Catholic Church, and to provide a deeper understanding of the phenomena that have intrigued and horrified us in equal measure. However, be forewarned as we set sail into these dark waters, where the lines between reality and the supernatural often blur. The accounts that lie ahead are harrowing, the details often disturbing. Stories of possession are raw, real and stark, often forcing us to confront the uncomfortable reality of human suffering and fear. Viewer discretion is advised. The journey into the shadowy realm of the possessed is not a voyage for the faint-hearted, but for those brave enough to dare, an enlightening exploration of their unknown awaits. The year was 1634. France, a nation bathed in religious tension and political upheaval, stood on the brink of the blood-soaked front, a series of civil wars that would soon tear through the heart of the kingdom. In the midst of this volatile era, the quiet town of Loudoun became the setting for a chilling spectacle that would forever echo through history. Nestled amid the rolling French countryside, Loudoun was a town of humble beauty, a place where the rhythms of life were dictated by the changing seasons and the tolling of the church bells. Yet, beneath this facade of tranquility, a sinister shadow was brewing. At the heart of the town stood the Ursuline convent, a stronghold of piety and devotion. But within its austere stone walls, an unseen malevolence was beginning to stir, an insidious force that would soon hold the convent, and indeed the entire town of Luden, in its terrifying grip. In these troubled times, the citizens of Luden lived with an ever-present sense of foreboding. The fear of the supernatural was as tangible as the cobblestones beneath their feet a morbid fascination interwoven with their deeply held religious beliefs. The stage was set for one of the most chilling episodes of demonic possession ever documented. A horrifying tableau that would mark the town of Loudoun with a stain of infamy. Little did the townsfolk know of the terror that was about to unfold, a grotesque dance between the living and the dead that would forever cast a shadow over their quaint pastoral haven. It began subtly, almost imperceptibly, in the hushed corridors of the Ursuline convent. A whisper of unease started to thread its way through the ranks of the nuns, a growing sense of dread that clung to the very stones of the ancient building. Sisters reported strange happenings, fleeting shadows that danced in the corners of their vision, strange discordant sounds that echoed through the chapel at night, and a feeling of being watched, of unseen eyes lingering upon them with a malevolent gaze, the atmosphere within the convent turned thick with fear, a pervasive dread that seemed to hang in the air. The once tranquil sanctuary had become a cauldron of unease, its halls echoing with the soft whispers of terror. Then, in the chill of a winter's night, the first of the possessions took hold. Sister Jeanne des Anges, the convent's mother superior, fell into inexplicable convulsions, her body contorting in ways that defied nature, her voice twisting into grotesque, guttural utterances. The sisters watched in horror as the pious Mother Superior, a beacon of virtue and spiritual guidance, succumbed to a force beyond their comprehension. As the unseen entity gripped her, she screamed of visions of demons, of horrific torment and tantalizing sin. 
The serene silence of the convent was shattered, replaced with the bone-chilling soundtrack of otherworldly possession. And with this first horrifying episode, the floodgates of terror were flung open, marking the onset of an ordeal that would plunge the Ursuline convent into the abyss of fear. Little did they realize this was merely the beginning. In the harrowing wake of the Mother Superior's possession, a sinister tide began to rise within the Ursuline convent. Other nuns started to exhibit similar horrifying symptoms. A demonic contagion seemed to be spreading through the stone cloisters, seizing one devout sister after another. Their serene lives of prayer and service were thrown into tumult, their peace shattered by an invisible force that seemed hell-bent on torment. One by one, the sisters succumbed. Bodies contorted in grotesque paroxysms, voices twisted into ungodly utterances, and serene faces transformed into masks of sheer terror. The once quiet chapel echoed with the cacophony of their shrieks, the air charged with a palpable dread. These were no longer the virtuous sisters of Luden. They had become unwilling vessels for unseen entities, forced to partake in a morbid spectacle that struck raw terror into the hearts of the townsfolk. Word of the demonic infestation within the Ursuline convent rippled through the community of Luden. A chill of fear swept through the town, every whisper, every hushed conversation marked with a trembling apprehension. The contagion had not only infected the bodies of the nuns, but the very spirit of Loudon. As the sun set each day, the townsfolk huddled within their homes, fearful of the sinister spectacles unfolding just a stone's throw away within the walls of the convent. This was an ordeal far from over. In fact, the darkest days were yet to dawn. As the sun dipped below the horizon, the Ursuline convent descended further into chaos. Night upon night, the torment escalated, each episode of possession more horrifying than the last. The nuns, once symbols of tranquility and devotion, were trapped in a nightmarish dance with invisible tormentors, their bodies and minds serving as the stage for an unspeakable spectacle. Eyewitnesses painted macabre images of the possessed nuns exhibiting unnerving feats of strength and flexibility, defying the bounds of human capability. They spoke of seeing the nuns levitate, their bodies contorting in ways unnatural and inhuman. The sisters voiced strange tongues, their words a chilling mix of blasphemy and profanity, sounding more like the growls of beasts than the voices of women. Most troubling were the consistent, detailed visions they recounted of demonic figures, shadowy and menacing, whispering promises of torment and sin. The sheer horror of these revelations, whispered in trembling tones by the sisters, sent ripples of terror through the community. The Ursuline convent, once a bastion of faith and piety, had transformed into a portal of unspeakable fear. The darkness that had descended upon Loudon was yet to recede, and the town remained under the shadow of a fear that would etch itself into the pages of history. In the chilling shadow of these nightmarish events, the figure of Father Urbane Grandia loomed ominously. An enigmatic character, he was the priest of Saint-Pierre-du-Marche in Loudon, captivating locals with his charismatic sermons and magnetic charm. Yet beneath his surface allure lay a troubling undercurrent, whispers of unorthodox alliances and moral transgressions that simmered beneath the town's collective consciousness. As the demonic possessions continued to consume the Ursuline convent, a terrifying narrative began to unfold around Grandier. The possessed nuns, trapped in the throes of their disturbing afflictions, named him as their tormentor, alleging a diabolical pact he had forged with the Prince of Darkness. The townsfolk, already ensnared in a web of fear and suspicion, clung to this narrative with a dread-filled desperation. Beneath the church's bell tower, Grandier's accusers painted a terrifying picture of clandestine rituals and unholy ceremonies. Tales emerged of a spectral figure seen wandering through the cloisters late at night, whispering forbidden incantations as he conjured the forces of the underworld. These chilling accounts added fuel to the allegations against Grandier, casting him in the dreadful role of a demon conjurer. As fear continued to grip Luden, Grandier found himself at the heart of a trial that was as much a spectacle of horror as it was a judicial proceeding. Witnesses testified with trembling voices, their accounts thick with fear and superstition. Every gasp, 
every accusation turned the trial into a petrifying narrative of demonic conspiracies and satanic pacts, painting Grandier as the orchestrator of the darkness that had descended upon Loudun. This ordeal, the trial of Father Urban Grandier, would leave an indelible stain on the storied history of exorcism. The town waited with bated breath, locked in the chilling grip of fear. With Father Grandier accused, and the town of Laudin held captive in a vice of fear, the church had no choice but to act. What followed was a chilling series of exorcisms that would remain etched into the annals of history as a macabre dance between good and evil. The scene within the Ursuline convent was as dreadful as it was mesmerizing. Exorcists, robed in white, their faces grave with solemn determination, stood before the possessed nuns. The chapel, once a sanctum of tranquility and devotion, had been transformed into a battlefield of spiritual warfare. The air was thick with the stench of fear, mingling with the scent of holy water and burning incense. One by one, the exorcists approached their distressed charges. As they began to chant in Latin, voices resonating in an eerie harmony, the nuns writhed and howled, their bodies convulsing in grotesque defiance. The sacred verses of exorcism, meant to cast out the demons, seemed to incite even more terror within the possessed. Witnesses spoke of disturbing scenes that seemed to defy all rational explanation. The possessed nuns demonstrated superhuman strength, their bodies levitating, contorting, their voices taking on monstrous tones as they spoke in unknown languages. As the exorcisms grew more intense, so did the manifestations of possession, leading to a terrifying climax that left the spectators in stunned silence. Amid this chilling spectacle, the exorcists persisted, undeterred by the demonic defiance. The exorcism rituals, usually a conduit of peace, had become a chilling showdown against an invisible enemy. The outcome remained uncertain, the struggle ongoing. Each evening, as the sun set, it plunged Loudon further into the depths of a haunting darkness from which there seemed to be no escape. In the aftermath of the harrowing exorcisms, the town of Luden was left forever marked by the shadow of the events that had transpired. The once bustling streets fell silent, the air heavy with an unseen burden. The dread had subsided, replaced by a haunting emptiness. The echoes of the chilling exorcisms still seemed to linger in the town's ancient stone walls, whispering ghostly tales of the horror they had witnessed. The fate of Father Urbain Grandier was sealed amidst these spectral echoes. Condemned by the fearful cries of the possessed nuns and the town's desperate need for a scapegoat, Grandier met a terrifying end. Accused of witchcraft and consorting with demons, he was sentenced to death by burning. As the flames consumed him, his anguished screams reverberated through the town, serving as a chilling reminder of the dreadful saga. Yet, amidst the ashes of Grandier's life and the haunting silence of the aftermath, an eerie sense of calm descended upon the Ursuline convent. The demonic manifestations that had once consumed the nuns seemed to have dissipated. Their bodies no longer writhed in torment, their voices no longer echoed with monstrous tones. It was as if the infernal presence that had once claimed them had been extinguished with Grandier's life. The exorcisms, it appeared, had been successful. But the legacy of these events lived on, the memories forever seared into the minds of those who had witnessed them. The walls of the Ursuline convent bore silent testament to the horrifying ordeal, every stone whispering tales of the demonic possession that had gripped the town. Even as the ashes of Father Grandia called and the chilling echoes of the exorcisms faded, the haunting tale of the Loudon possessions was far from over. The terror that gripped the town had sent ripples throughout the world, forever changing our perception of the spectral and unseen. The Loudon saga, a chilling dance between faith and fear, innocence and evil, raised questions that transcended its historical context. It brought into sharp focus the very essence of human fear and our desperate struggle to make sense of the unknown. This was not merely a tale of demonic possession, it was a harrowing narrative of societal fears, of faith tested by fire, and the darkness that can consume even the most devout. These historical events became a spectral mirror held up to the face of society, forcing us to confront the most terrifying aspects of our nature. The demons that had once tormented the Ursuline nuns continue to haunt us in more ways than we can imagine. 
taking form in our deepest fears, our harshest judgments, and our most desperate acts. In the silence of the Laudun convent, in the whispers of the town's ancient walls, and in the chilling echoes of Grandier's death cries, we find a chilling reminder of the fragility of human sanity when confronted with the unknown. The story of the Laudun possessions is a spectral saga that lingers at the edge of our collective consciousness. Through our exploration, the spectre of Laudun lives on, a haunting presence forever looming in the shadowy corners of our past. Our journey through the spectral annals of demonic possession leads us from the echoing stones of Laudun to the quiet simplicity of a small town in Wisconsin in the early 20th century. Here, nestled amidst the calm, we find an unassuming figure at the heart of another haunting tale, Anna Eklund, a woman whose life would become the stage for one of the most chilling tales of possession ever recorded. Anna's life before the possession was marked by a deceptive tranquility as ordinary as the serene landscape of her rural home. Born in 1882 to devout parents, she led a seemingly uneventful existence, the details of her early years shrouded in the mundanity of everyday life. Yet beneath this serene surface, unseen shadows were gathering, waiting to cast her into a chilling narrative that would echo through time. Her father and aunt, figures who should have been sources of care and guidance, harbored a darker nature. They planted the seeds of what would become Anna's terrifying ordeal. Anna's father, embittered by his own disdain for the church and a deep-seated resentment, along with her malicious aunt, cursed the innocent girl, calling upon the dark forces to invade her soul. This innocent child, unaware of the malevolent intent surrounding her, began to display disturbing behaviors as she matured. Strangely repulsed by sacred objects, she developed an aversion to churches, her body writhing inexplicably as if trying to escape an unseen terror. Little did anyone know, these were the harbingers of the horrifying events that would define Anna Eklund's life and etch her name into the chilling lore of demonic possession. The malignant seeds planted by Anna's father and aunt began to bloom into a horrifying spectacle. A spectre had found its way into her life, wrapping its cold grip around her soul. The ordinary landscapes of Anna's life started to twist and warp into a dark, grotesque theater of the supernatural. Anna's repulsion towards sacred objects escalated, her body convulsing uncontrollably whenever she attempted to enter a church. Her eyes, once filled with the light of innocence, now blazed with an eerie glow, revealing a terrifying presence lurking within. An unnatural strength surged within her, the muscles of this petite woman flexing with a force that could defy several grown men. Words, foul and blasphemous, poured from her lips in voices not her own, spitting venom in languages she had never learned. German, Latin, Polish, tongues unfamiliar to the simple Midwestern girl, echoed from her throat in guttural growls and spiteful hisses. Her body twisted and contorted in inhuman postures, her back arching to the point of breaking, her limbs coiling and writhing like serpents. Her behavior took a more sinister turn as she developed an uncanny knowledge of hidden things, revealing secrets about people that she had no way of knowing. This once gentle soul now seemed to harbor a legion of demonic entities each manifesting their presence in horrific ways. The once tranquil home became a chamber of horrors. Objects moved of their own accord, shadows danced in the corners of rooms, an icy chill filled the air, and a constant oppressive sense of evil hung heavily over the household. The innocent life of Anna Eklund had turned into a relentless nightmare, a chilling symphony of demonic manifestation. The church, confronted by the horrific manifestation of Anna's possession, responded with its most potent spiritual weapon, the rite of exorcism. Father Theophilus Riesinger, a Capuchin monk known for his experience in battling the demonic, was called upon to free Anna from her torment. Yet this would not be a swift victory. Anna's deliverance would be a grueling, drawn-out war against the forces of darkness, fought over decades. The first exorcism was conducted in 1912, when Anna was just 30 years old. Father Riesinger, in his battle against the unseen, performed the ancient rites, 
commanding the demons to depart. But the entities within Anna resisted fiercely. Her body convulsed, her voice echoed with guttural roars, and she displayed a preternatural knowledge of the priest's secrets. However, after intense spiritual battle, a brief calm descended. It seemed as though the ordeal was over, but the tranquility was short-lived and the evil returned, even more ferocious than before. In the years that followed, Anna's case grew in severity and complexity. Each attempted exorcism only seemed to infuriate the entities further. They mocked the priests, laughed at their prayers, and made Anna's body perform terrifying contortions. This hellish battle reached its peak in 1928 when the church made an unprecedented decision. Anna was to be subjected to a series of prolonged exorcisms at a secluded convent in Erling, Iowa. In this isolated location, away from the prying eyes of the public, the chilling theater of exorcism played out over weeks. Reports from these sessions tell tales of levitation, inhuman voices, and hideous transformations. Anna, defying all laws of nature, vomited <coughs> objects of considerable size, spouted venomous blasphemies, and displayed knowledge of distant events. This struggle marked one of the longest and most grueling exorcisms in recorded history, with the frail woman at the epicenter caught in a relentless tug of war between the sacred and the profane. Anna Eklund's case was notorious, not merely for the duration of her torment, but also for the extraordinary manifestations that accompanied her possession. Witnesses reported phenomena that challenged the boundaries of human comprehension, starkly revealing the darkness within. Perhaps the most unnerving of these were the voices, deep, monstrous tones that issued from Anna's lips. The voices weren't merely unsettling in their timbre, they also conversed in languages that Anna, an American of modest education, could not possibly have known. Ancient tongues such as Latin, Hebrew and Polish were among the languages documented. This, combined with her inexplicable knowledge of the priest's confidential matters and far-off happenings, bore the chilling hallmark of diabolic possession. Furthermore, witnesses to the exorcisms reported instances of levitation. Amidst the incantations and prayers, Anna's body would abruptly lift from the ground, defying the gravitational force that bound all other objects. The sight of this frail woman floating, consumed in her terrifying ordeal, is an image that haunted those present for the rest of their lives. Equally alarming was the transformation of her features during her fits. Her face would distort grotesquely, her eyes bulging out in a way that human eyes should not. Her mouth would gape wide, beyond normal limits, issuing forth revolting regurgitations. <coughs> These were no ordinary vomits. They contained an array of objects such as tobacco leaves and husks that she had not consumed. In the cloistered walls of the convent, reality bent and twisted in a nightmarish tableau echoing the horrifying struggle within Anna Eklund. A fight not merely for her body and mind, but for her very soul, in a realm where the rules of nature seemed to no longer apply. The horrors of Anna Eklund's possession took a devastating toll on her. Throughout the years, the physical strain of her ordeal manifested in disheartening ways. Her once healthy body shriveled into a skeletal figure, skin stretched over protruding bones, eyes sunken, lending her an almost ghastly appearance. It was as though the very life was being drained from her by the unseen entities that claimed her. Yet the physical torment was perhaps only a reflection of the psychological nightmare within. Anna, when lucid, bore a vacant, haunted look, as if gazing into an abyss only she could see. Her existence became a litany of fear, pain and confusion, a constant reminder of the alien forces violating her sanctity. Sleep, usually a refuge from the world's troubles, held no respite for her. Instead, it was in these vulnerable hours that the demons made their presence most known. She would awaken screaming in the dead of the night, wild-eyed and incoherent, with accounts of horrific visions and tormenting voices. It was a private hell that no one else could truly fathom. Furthermore, the stigma attached to being a victim of possession was an additional burden. As word of her case spread, she was met with a mix of fear, curiosity, and at times outright hostility from the society around her. This isolation was a bitter pill to swallow, adding to the already unbearable strain. In essence, Anna Eklund's ordeal transformed her existence into a waking nightmare. 
It was an existence where every moment held potential for terror, every aspect of her being under siege by an intangible yet potent malevolence. It was a chilling testament to the true horror of demonic possession, the complete invasion of self, the eroding of the boundary between the individual and the monstrous other. The shadow of Anna Eklund's case stretches long over the history of exorcism, a chilling reminder of the dark forces that may lurk unseen in our midst. Her story, laden with shocking details and vivid manifestations, sent a wave of dread rippling through society. It forced the Catholic Church and the world at large to confront the unsettling reality of demonic possession in its most egregious form. Anna's case became a reference point in the history of demonic possession. It was unprecedented in the sheer number and intensity of the possessions and the extreme measures taken for her deliverance. The descriptions of Anna's ordeal were meticulously documented, each gut-wrenching detail serving as a guideline for future exorcisms. Her story prompted a deeper exploration into the nature of possession and the practices to combat it. The church's clergy were compelled to bolster their knowledge and approach towards exorcism. It sparked increased study into the rites, fueling a drive for a more methodical, comprehensive strategy to face these spiritual emergencies. But the impact extended beyond the church. Anna's case reverberated throughout popular culture, inspiring numerous works that explored the terrifying premise of demonic possession. Her ordeal was brought to life in books, films and tales that challenged the boundaries of horror, keeping audiences perennially captivated and petrified. In essence, the legacy of Anna Eklund's case is its enduring testament to the terrifying power of the demonic realm. It's a dreadful narrative that continues to echo through the centuries, a stark reminder of the darkness that may descend when the demonic breaches the human realm, a darkness that once bore the name Anna Eklund. In the quiet corners of Jersey, on the lush island nestled between England and France, a man named Michel Columbia was living a seemingly ordinary life. Yet an unseen beast was about to turn his world into a living nightmare, pushing the boundaries of our understanding of terror. Michel was an average man, neither particularly notable nor notoriously infamous. He was known for his humble life, running a small thriving grocery store that was frequented by the island's close-knit community. He was a familiar, comforting presence for many, always ready with a warm smile and friendly banter. Little did anyone know that behind this facade of normalcy, an impending horror was brewing. The year was 1972, and Michelle's life was about to take a horrific turn. Ordinary days gave way to a perpetual nightmare, a waking horror that would make his name infamous. A malevolent presence, known in whispers as the Beast of Jersey, was about to claw its way into Michelle's reality, turning his mundane life into a chilling saga of terror that would leave an indelible mark on the annals of demonic possessions. Michel's metamorphosis into the so-called Beast of Jersey stands as a horrifying chapter in the history of demonology. The once jovial, friendly man turned into a horrifying spectacle as he succumbed to something much darker and more insidious. Neighbors began reporting disturbing instances like hearing guttural growls emanating from his home late into the night. Some even claim to have seen a terrifying figure looming in the shadows, eyes glowing with an infernal light, a sight that would haunt their dreams for years to come. His physical changes were startlingly shocking. His skin, once healthy and full of life, turned sallow and cold. His eyes, once sparkling with mirth, were now hollow, filled with a terrifying emptiness that seemed to pierce the soul of anyone who dared meet his gaze. But what unsettled onlookers the most were the inhuman sounds he began to make. His voice, no longer his own, but a ghastly growl that terrified and paralyzed anyone within earshot. Michel's transformation wasn't just a personal nightmare. It began to terrorize the entire island community. The once jovial store owner became a figure of dread. His store no longer a place of community, but a harrowing reminder of the nightmare living among them. Rumors about the Beast of Jersey began to circulate with an increasing sense of dread. This once ordinary man had now become an embodiment of their darkest fears, a ghastly reminder of the horrors that can befall even the most unsuspecting souls. In the face of such profound darkness, 
the local church found itself thrust into an unfathomable struggle to reclaim Michel from the insidious grip of the beast. The clergy, although skeptical at first, soon accepted the grim reality. They enlisted the assistance of experienced exorcists from across the English Channel in an attempt to quell the malevolent force that had seized Michel. The ritualistic battles between the holy men and the beast within Michel were ghastly to behold. Witnesses spoke of the ground trembling beneath their feet, of flickering candles suddenly bursting into unnatural, vibrant flames, and of chilling winds whipping through the sanctum despite no doors or windows being open. The air grew thick with an almost palpable dread, the tension mounting with each recited verse from the Holy Scriptures. Michel, or rather the entity that controlled him, raged against these spiritual intrusions. His reactions were violent, bordering on the monstrous. He convulsed on the ground, howling in an unrecognizable tongue, his eyes rolled back to reveal an unnerving white. He displayed superhuman strength, requiring several men to restrain him. The beast showed an uncanny awareness of the exorcist's darkest secrets, taunting them with private sins and personal failures, attempting to break their spirit. Yet, despite the terrifying spectacle, the exorcists held steadfast. Drenched in sweat, their voices hoarse, they persevered through hours, even days of ritualistic combat. These spiritual warriors faced an unimaginable evil, wielding only their faith and determination in the grueling bid to save Michel from his tormented fate. Viewing Michel's case through the lens of modern mental health understanding, a layer of eerie ambiguity settles over the tale. What was once readily accepted as the work of a malevolent beast could also bear the symptoms of severe mental illness. Transformations and uncharacteristic behaviors that Michel exhibited might have been manifestations of untreated psychological conditions. Could the beast of Jersey have been a misunderstood sufferer of a malady that was unknown at the time? Yet, even with this perspective, there are elements that remain unsettlingly inexplicable. The guttural languages spoken by Michel, the physical feats beyond human strength, the uncanny knowledge of deeply personal details. How can these be explained solely by the realms of psychology? Do they not still hint at something far more sinister, something beyond our current understanding? This thought ignites a chilling realization. Perhaps the demons we perceive are not solely spiritual or psychological, but a terrifying blend of both. Could it be possible that we're only beginning to understand the true nature of such horrific incidents? This possibility tugs at the fringes of our understanding, casting an unsettling shadow over what we perceive as known, and plunging us deeper into the mysterious abyss of the human mind. The case of Michelle Columbia, the Beast of Jersey, sent shivers down the spines of locals and those far beyond the boundaries of Jersey. As news of his haunting ordeal spread, it gripped the public with a morbid fascination. The calm island community was thrown into a turmoil of fear, questioning, and disbelief. His story was whispered in hushed tones, passed along from one trembling mouth to another, intensifying in terror with each recounting. Yet, it was not just a tale told to elicit scares. It forced a confrontation with the unexplainable, the terrifying, and the supernatural that exists in the shadows of our world. Meanwhile, the wider world watched in uneasy silence as one of their own, a man who was once just an ordinary member of society, was consumed by an evil far beyond comprehension. The response was a cocktail of skepticism, fascination, and fear. Many dismissed it as superstitious nonsense, a product of an overactive, fear-stricken imagination. Yet, there were others who couldn't deny the irrational fear that invaded their psyche at the mention of Michel's story, the inexplicable that simply couldn't be shrugged off. And so, the tale of Michel Columbia rippled through society, leaving a trail of unease and a cloud of unanswered questions in its wake. His ordeal served as a chilling reminder that there is more to this world than what meets the eye. In the aftermath of the exorcisms, Michel Columbia, the man who had once been a living nightmare as the Beast of Jersey, found himself facing the remnants of his former life. His journey was not over, it was a new beginning marked by the echoes of his haunted past. Michel seemed to return to his senses, his demeanor changed, his gaze less feral. 
Yet, beneath the surface, he was a man haunted, not just by the demonic entity that had once possessed him, but also by the memory of the horror he had inflicted and endured. The darkness had retreated, yet its shadow lingered, imprinted on his soul. In his eyes, there was a hollow weariness, a silent testament to the torment he had undergone. Every glance in the mirror served as a stark reminder of the time when he was the beast, his own face an eternal epitaph to the darkest period of his life. Despite these trials, Michel strived to reintegrate himself into society. Each day was a battle against the phantom pains of his former possession, the whispers of his past life as the beast ever present. Yet he stood resolute, an emblem of human resilience in the face of unspeakable terror. But even as Michel sought redemption and peace, his tale served as an eerie reminder of the reality of darkness, hidden in the shadows of everyday life. It was a stark narrative, a chilling ghost story, whispering the terrifying saga of a man who once became the Beast of Jersey. In the heart of the Bavarian countryside, where verdant pastures sprawl under the watchful gaze of the Alps, Annelise Michel, a simple and devout girl, lived an ordinary life. Unbeknownst to her, fate had a twisted path woven into her seemingly unremarkable existence. Her life was a testament to simplicity. Annelise's family was devoutly Catholic, their faith an enduring flame that cast a comforting glow on their mundane existence. She grew up in the shadow of the church's ancient spire, her life rhythms echoing the tolling bells that marked the passing hours. A diligent student, Annalisa showed promise in her studies, often seen with her nose buried in books. The flicker of laughter and vivacity danced in her eyes, a youthful exuberance that was as infectious as it was endearing. Beneath her joyous facade, however, an undercurrent of profound religious devotion flowed. She was often found in the quiet corners of the church, whispering prayers under her breath. But the comfort and security of her tranquil existence would soon shatter, replaced by a reality darker and more terrifying than any ghost story. And when the sinister tendrils of the supernatural began to creep into her life, Annelise Michel would find herself at the heart of one of the most controversial and terrifying cases of demonic possession ever documented. Annalisa's descent into the abyss of terror began subtly, like a hushed whisper echoing through the caverns of her consciousness. At first, it was faint, a nebulous dread coiling in the pit of her stomach, shadows that danced at the edge of her vision. But the whisper soon grew into an agonizing scream, leaving a trail of shattered sanity in its wake. She was 16 when she suffered her first seizure. An invisible hand seemed to seize her mind, her body convulsing as if racked by invisible lightning. Doctors diagnosed her with temporal lobe epilepsy, a condition that can induce vivid hallucinations and altered states of consciousness. But as the medication remained ineffective, a more insidious explanation began to emerge from the depths of the unknown. Annalisa began to report seeing hideous faces, their grotesque features distorted by malice, their eyes ablaze with malevolence. They would whisper terrifying things to her, tales of damnation, of eternal suffering. The scent of burning sulphur would fill her nostrils, a pungent reminder of the hellfire that these apparitions promised. Her behavior grew increasingly erratic. A girl who had once found solace in the embrace of her faith now recoiled from religious artifacts. Crosses would burn her skin, holy water sizzled on contact, and the sight of the Holy Scripture would send her spiralling into a fit of uncontrollable rage. The girl who had once found comfort in the church's hallowed halls was now tormented by what seemed to be an unholy force, transforming her life into a living nightmare. This was not the Annalisa her family and friends knew. This was something else, something sinister. A sense of dread enveloped her loved ones as they watched her suffer. The horror of her situation was all too real, too palpable. Annalisa Michel was not merely ill, she was in the clutches of a terror far more chilling, far more diabolical. She was, it seemed, possessed. Plunged into a nightmare, the Michel family sought refuge in the realm of the divine. After all, 
If medicine could not aid their afflicted daughter, perhaps the grace of God could. Two priests, Arnold Rentz and Ernst Alt, embarked on an arduous battle against the unseen malevolence that gripped Anneliese. A battle of faith, a battle of spirit, a battle that would span over an excruciating year. The priests performed the Roman Catholic rite of exorcism over 60 times on the beleaguered girl. They reported that Anneliese was possessed not by one, but by six demonic entities. Among them, Lucifer, Cain, Judas Iscariot, and Nero. The implication was horrifying, an unholy congregation residing within a once innocent girl. In the chill of the exorcism room, the air would thicken with tension, charged with an electric fear. Anneliese would spew vile obscenities, a grotesque parody of the serene girl she once was. She would levitate, her body defying the laws of nature as it rose from the ground, suspended in a dreadful tableau of the impossible. As they chanted the sacred words of the exorcism, the priests bore witness to terrifying transformations. Annalisa's voice would warp and contort into an eerie chorus, each entity taking its turn to hiss threats and blasphemies. Amid the cacophony, Annalisa would shriek and wail, her cries a chilling testament to the agony she was enduring. The hours would stretch into infinity, the room echoing with prayers, chants and demonic vitriol. The priests, firm in their conviction, persisted, matching every monstrous howl with solemn declarations of faith. And yet, the darkness within Annalisa seemed insurmountable, a relentless tide of malevolence that resisted every effort to banish it. Over a year the battle raged on, a seemingly endless cycle of exorcisms, rest and resurgence of the dark forces. Yet, despite their unwavering resolve, the priests could only watch as Annalisa, the unwilling battlefield of this celestial war, wasted away before their eyes. It was a horror beyond reckoning, a testament to the relentless terrifying power of the unseen. The battle ended in tragedy. Annalisa Michel, a life extinguished too soon, succumbed not to the demonic but to the earthly, malnutrition and dehydration. It was a chilling end to a chilling saga, but the terror was far from over. The death of Annalisa Michel was merely the overture to a macabre symphony of legal battles and public outcry that was to follow. The German state accused the priests and Annalisa's parents of negligent homicide. The argument was that they had denied her necessary medical attention, which had led to her untimely death. The trial, known as the Klingenberg case, was a media spectacle, casting a ghastly light on the dark corners of exorcism and demonology. The courtroom became a stage where science and faith clashed in a cacophony of arguments and counter-arguments. The prosecutors contended that Annalisa had been mentally ill, possibly suffering from epilepsy and psychosis. Her disturbing behavior, they claimed, was the result of uncontrolled seizures and hallucinations. On the other side of the court, the defense stood firm on the ground of faith, insisting that Annalisa was genuinely possessed. They spoke of the abhorrent phenomena they had witnessed, the ghastly voices, the inhuman strength, the aversion to sacred objects. All were signs, they claimed, that pointed to the reality of possession. The public was divided, the scales of opinion perpetually tipping in favor of one side or the other. The fervent believers rallied behind the church and the Michels, seeing the case as an attack on their faith. The skeptics, however, threw their weight behind the prosecutors, appalled at the perceived medieval practices in the modern age. In the end, the court ruled in favor of the prosecution. The priests and Annalisa's parents were found guilty of manslaughter resulting from negligence and were sentenced to six months in jail, later suspended, and three years of probation. Even as the storm of the trial began to wane, a new front opened, this time in the minds of the medical community. The ghostly echoes of Annalisa Michel's screams haunted the ivory towers of psychiatry, forcing the denizens to confront a disturbing question. Was the torment of Annalisa Michel truly the work of demons, or was it the result of an all-too-human malady? Modern psychiatry offered a chilling explanation. The dreadful visions, the grotesque transformations, the violent convulsions, could they all be symptoms of not a spiritual but a psychiatric ailment? The key to understanding this lay in the murky waters of Annalisa's mind. Psychiatric professionals opined that Annalisa may have been suffering from a severe form of schizophrenia, a mental disorder characterized by delusions, hallucinations and distorted thinking. 
The alien voices, the intense aversion to religious symbols, the violent outbursts, could have been the manifestations of this mental illness. The grim aura of possession they proposed might have been an externalization of her internal turmoil, a mind projecting its nightmares onto the canvas of reality. Another theory suggested temporal lobe epilepsy. This disorder, originating in the brain's temporal lobe, could induce intense visions, auditory hallucinations, and extreme changes in personality and mood, a perfect storm that could have created a psychological landscape resembling demonic possession. The shadow of dissociative identity disorder also loomed large. Annalisa's transformations into various demonic entities could have been indicative of multiple identities, a classic symptom of this disorder. Her identities might have taken the form of demonic entities due to her deep-rooted religious beliefs, her mind creating a gruesome theatre of spiritual warfare. These theories, while scientifically grounded, added another layer of horror to Annelise's story. The prospect of a mind turning against itself, crafting elaborate and horrifying delusions, was as terrifying, if not more, as the notion of demonic possession and it brought into stark focus the disturbing reality of mental health issues and the importance of proper diagnosis and treatment. Beyond the courtroom and the psychiatric studies, the haunting story of Annelise Michel continued to cast long eerie shadows. Its tendrils reached out, grasping the public consciousness and wrapping tightly around the world of popular culture, planting seeds of terror that would bloom into gruesome spectacles on silver screens and paperback novels. It began with whispers, tales told in hushed tones, recounted with a shudder in the dark corners of pubs and living rooms. Then it spread like wildfire, fueled by the press, taking a form that was larger than life and far more terrifying. In 2005, the sinister tale found its way to Hollywood, spawning the horror film The Exorcism of Emily Rose. This cinematic retelling, while a work of fiction, was rooted in the chilling reality of Annalisa's case, stirring a potent cocktail of horror and curiosity in the hearts of viewers worldwide. It portrayed an eerie reflection of the court case, painting a picture of the tragic collision between faith, fear, and the unexplainable. Her horrifying narrative also found its way into music, with the band Slipknot referencing her in the haunting track, The Heretic Anthem. In literature too, her story left its grim mark, with Felicitas D. Goodman's book, The Exorcism of Annalisa Michel, delving into the gruesome details of her ordeal, providing a chilling account of the case. Annalisa's story became a morbid symbol, a cultural touchstone around the topic of possession. It led to a spike in public interest in exorcism and the supernatural, and at the same time, opened a discourse on mental health, misdiagnosis, and the often blurry line between the spiritual and the psychological. The tale of Annalisa Michel, once a whisper in the wind, had now grown into a howling gale that swept across the landscape of popular culture, her tragic end becoming a source of endless fascination, speculation and morbid entertainment. The tormented Bavarian girl had transcended her human form, her story now a spectre that continued to haunt the world. In the quiet, blue-collar town of West Pittston, Pennsylvania, nestled between the meandering Susquehanna River and the verdant expanse of the Susquehanna State Park, sat an unassuming duplex house. A white two-story structure, it was here that the Smurl family, parents Jack and Janet, their four daughters, Dawn, Heather, Shannon and Karen, along with Jack's parents, sought to carve out a life of peaceful ordinariness. Little did they know, their tranquil family home was soon to become the setting of a terrifying saga that would stretch over 15 harrowing years. The Smurls were your average, hard-working, all-American family. Jack worked in the city, while Janet maintained their home, tending to the children and the household with diligent care. Jack's parents lived on the other side of the duplex, the generations living side by side under the same roof, a picture of familial harmony. In the early years, their life was the epitome of normalcy. Children's laughter echoed within the walls of their home, holiday gatherings were occasions for joy, and the family went about their daily lives with an air of contentment, 
Their home was a sanctuary, a refuge from the world outside. But that sanctuary was about to be violated in the most nightmarish manner, as an unseen menace began to seep into the very fabric of their existence. Unbeknownst to the Smurl family, their lives were on the brink of a descent into an abyss of horror, from which there seemed no escape. The first stirrings of the nightmare awoke quietly. In 1974, subtle occurrences went unnoticed in the everyday chaos of family life. Tools missing from their rightful places, inexplicable drafts sending a chill down their spines, stains appearing on freshly cleaned carpets. These seemingly mundane inconveniences slowly sowed the seeds of dread. Yet, the mundane swiftly turned malevolent. A dark, icy hand began to close around their home. Radios and televisions switched channels of their own accord, power tools activated in an empty basement, and putrid odors wafted through rooms without a discernible source. Beneath the veil of the ordinary, an ominous force was staking its claim. As if to announce its presence, the Smurl's peaceful existence was shattered by disembodied voices that seemed to ricochet off the walls. Blood-curdling screams filled the dead of night, waking the family in terror. <laughs> The laughter of an unseen presence <laughs> echoed through their home, an eerie counterpoint to their growing fear. The family pets, always attuned to the unseen, began to act strangely. Their dog growled at empty corners, hair standing on end as it backed away from nothingness. Their bird fell silent, eyes wide and feathers fluffed in fear, staring at invisible threats. For the Smurls, what had begun as an annoyance had escalated into a full-scale haunting, the darkness creeping closer with each passing day. Little did they know, the true terror was only just beginning. With the seed of terror sown, it was now time for the harvest. The entity plaguing the Smurl family grew emboldened. No longer content with stirring up unease, it began asserting its malevolent power in more tangible, violent ways. Reports of objects violently hurled across rooms became increasingly frequent, accompanied by unsettling manifestations that left the family fearing for their lives. In the heart of their home, where once laughter and love echoed, the demonic presence reigned. The temperature would plummet inexplicably, frost crystallizing on window panes, even in the height of summer. Then the temperature would rise to stifling heights, as if the house itself was a creature breathing hot and heavy down their necks. Physical assaults became a horrific reality for the Smurls. The innocent were not spared, with the children reportedly levitating in their sleep their small forms rigid as unseen forces took hold. The adults experienced brutal attacks that left physical evidence, scratches, bite marks, and worse. However, the most bone-chilling occurrences involved reported instances of possession. The family matriarch, Janet, was said to have been the primary target. Her eyes, once warm and caring, would suddenly turn cold and distant. In these moments, a voice not her own would echo from her lips uttering phrases in languages she had no knowledge of. Each episode was an agonizing spectacle, ending with Janet collapsing in exhaustion, the entity seemingly receding back into the house's dark corners. The terror that gripped the Smurl household escalated from merely unsettling disturbances to a reign of unimaginable horror. The invisible assailant was no longer just a nuisance, it was a threat to their lives their sanity, and their very souls. In the darkest hours, when all hope seemed lost, a beacon emerged in the form of Ed and Lorraine Warren. The couple, already distinguished within the world of paranormal investigations for their work on renowned cases like the Amityville haunting, agreed to assist the beleaguered family. Their arrival heralded a sense of hope. Would their expertise finally put an end to the Smurl's torment? The Warrens' first encounter with the Smurl family's invisible tormentor was a chilling experience. The entity did not shy away. Rather, it reveled in their presence. Objects swirled through the air, an unseen wind tearing through the house, creating a cyclone of chaos. A chilling voice, distant yet deafening, whispered threats and obscenities into their ears. Undeterred, the Warrens began their work in earnest. Lorraine, a self-proclaimed clairvoyant, performed a walkthrough of the home. Her face paled as she sensed the demonic presence. Its strength and malevolence far surpassed anything she had previously encountered. Ed, meanwhile, conducted interviews and collected physical evidence, documenting every unexplained phenomenon. Over several visits, the Warrens gathered a wealth of information, 
concluding that the Smurl family was indeed dealing with a powerful demonic entity. According to the couple, the being was not just haunting the house, but had ensnared the family in a web of terror. It was an invisible puppeteer, yanking their strings, manipulating them for its insidious enjoyment. This confirmation by the famed paranormal investigators, while chilling, was a testament to the Smurls' terrifying reality. The haunting was real, it was dangerous, and it had the Smurl family firmly in its grasp. Yet, as the Smurls' chilling narrative spread beyond the confines of their tormented home, not everyone was convinced. The family, trapped in a nightmare, found themselves under a new form of assault. Not from the demonic entity, but from a skeptical world. News of the haunting had seeped into the media, and it wasn't long before the Smurl family's claims became a topic of intense debate. Doubt cast its long shadow over their tale, chilling in its own way. Some neighbors reported never hearing or witnessing any of the alleged disturbances. Others whispered accusations of deceit and fabrications, speculating that the Smurls sought financial gain or public attention. Prominent skeptics in the field of the paranormal, such as the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry, challenged the credibility of the haunting. They pointed to the lack of objective, verifiable evidence and questioned the reliability of the Warrens, who, they claimed, had a history of promoting dubious hauntings. Psychologists suggested alternative explanations, including mass hysteria or shared hallucinations. Some pointed towards the intense stress the family had been under, offering the idea of a psychological rather than paranormal cause. This ignited debates in academic circles, the case of the Smurl haunting oscillating between the domains of the supernatural and the psychological. The family's claims, once a cry for help, had become a controversial topic dissected by the public, media and experts alike. The Smurls, already caught in a melee of fear, found themselves needing to defend their haunting reality in the court of public opinion. The demon was no longer their only adversary, they were now facing a skeptical world, one not ready to believe in the unseen. Despite the cloud of skepticism that hung over them, the Smurl family steadfastly stood by their experiences. Then, just as abruptly as it had begun, the haunting reportedly came to an end. The year was 1986, and the terror that had gripped the family for a grueling 12 years seemed to lose its icy grasp. The silence in their Pennsylvania home was no longer filled with the sinister whispers of a demonic presence, but with a newfound tranquility. However, the specter of the haunting refused to fade away. In fact, the story of the Smurl family found a place in popular culture, their ordeal echoing in books, television programs and movies. The most famous of these was The Haunted, a book penned by Robert Curran with the Warrens and later adapted into a made-for-TV movie. The Smurl case continues to provoke questions and debate among believers, skeptics and those in between. Was the Smurl family truly besieged by demonic forces, or were they victims of their own minds, trapped in a psychological maze of fear and stress? The haunting's legacy lives on, not just in its popular adaptations, but in its ability to challenge our understanding of reality. Even today, the case holds an eerie relevance, a ghostly reflection of our collective fears. It stands as a potent symbol of the terrifyingly intangible, the menacingly mysterious, and their enduring human fascination with the world of the supernatural. In the unassuming town of Cottage City, Maryland, a tale unfolded in 1949 that would chill the bones of all who heard it. Roland Doe, a name draped in a cloak of anonymity, was a boy of just 14, his life unremarkable but for the horror that would soon consume it. An average boy, a lover of games and the quiet tranquility of family life, Roland was oblivious to the nightmare that was yet to envelop him. One winter's evening it began. The mundane comfort of their household was shattered by the inexplicable. Whispers echoed through the house when no one else was around. The household objects gained a sinister life of their own, moving inexplicably, and an unseen chill permeated the house. And at the epicenter of it all, was Roland, a boy suddenly plagued by an unseen terror. The unassuming reality of Roland's existence had morphed into a ghastly tale, one that would inspire the seminal horror film, The Exorcist. 
What had begun as an ordinary life was now a chilling script in the theatre of the macabre, and the tale of Roland Doe would forever remain an alarming reminder of a world beyond our understanding. This was not the end, but the start of a tale that would twist and turn in ways unimaginable, culminating in a shocking climax. The chilling descent into the depths of Roland's torment began subtly. A light flickered, a cold draught swept through a sealed room, a picture frame fell from the wall without cause. Roland, once filled with the spark of youth, was now a vessel of something dark and uninvited. His once playful eyes dulled and glazed over, his laughter replaced with cries of anguish that reverberated through the cold, silent nights. Soon, the horrors escalated. Claw marks appeared on Roland's body, as if an unseen beast was marking its territory. The boy's bed shook violently in the dead of night, his body writhing in spasms beyond his control. Inhuman growls echoed from his innocent lips, his speech transformed into an unrecognisable language that seemed older than time itself. And then, in an act that defied all understanding, the boy levitated before the terrified eyes of his parents, suspended in the air by an unseen force. For days, weeks, months even, the terror persisted, each day bringing a new form of torment. No one could say how or when it would end. The relentless possession became Roland's reality, and it seemed there was no respite from the malevolent spirit that held him captive. The boy they once knew was seemingly lost, trapped in a terrifying world beyond human comprehension. Summoning their courage and the power of their faith, a team of Catholic priests led by Father William Bowden undertook the monumental task of liberating Roland from the demonic clutches. Bowden, a seasoned priest, had the determination of a soldier going to war, the battlefield being the soul of a young boy. The ritual of exorcism, a sacred rite untouched by time, echoed through the rooms of the house. Latin incantations filled the air, mingling with the scent of sacred chrism oil and burning incense. Every corner of the room was sprinkled with holy water, each drop sizzling against the unseen force that held Roland hostage. As the priests began, Roland's body arched in unnatural angles, his voice alternating between pitiful sobs and guttural roars. The room grew icy cold, a terrifying contrast to the boy's feverishly hot skin. Invisible hands seemed to push against the holy men, trying to deter them from their mission. Yet the priests continued, reciting prayer after prayer, their voices rising over the boy's anguished screams. Scriptures were read aloud, the word of God piercing the dark presence. Throughout the lengthy process, the crucifix was held firmly, a beacon of light against the encompassing darkness. After several torturous sessions, a deafening roar echoed through the house, shaking its very foundations. The room fell abruptly silent, the oppressive darkness lifting. Roland's body, previously rigid and contorted, relaxed, his eyes clear for the first time in many torturous months. It seemed that the unyielding spirit had finally been banished, leaving behind a scarred but free young boy. The haunting had stopped, but its memory would last for generations. Emerging from the shadows of his tormented past, Roland began a new chapter of his life. A strange calm had replaced the frenzied terror. The boy who had once been the epicenter of otherworldly chaos now became an unremarkable, quiet individual. Free from the torment that had once gripped him, Roland moved away from Maryland, seeking anonymity in the ordinary. The years passed, and he grew into a man who bore little resemblance to the boy in the chilling tales. He married, raised children, and found solace in a life far removed from the supernatural. Never again did the ominous force that once controlled him resurface. The demonic grip that had seized his boyhood had been released. Meanwhile, the priests who had been instrumental in his deliverance found themselves forever changed. Father Bowden, in particular, was profoundly affected. For the rest of his life, he offered a daily mass for the boy he saved, the ordeal deepening his own faith. The priest, who had been a mere spectator to the supernatural, became a lifelong testament to the battle between good and evil. The collective accounts of the priests, laden with terror and resilience, were quietly stowed away in the secret archives of the church. 
Yet whispers of the story escaped, slowly seeping into public knowledge, stirring curiosity and horror in equal measure. The anonymity of Roland Doe preserved, the ordeal became a chilling reminder of a battle fought and won against darkness. When whispers of Roland's chilling tale began to infiltrate society, it wasn't long before they reached the ears of William Peter Blatty. A burgeoning writer, Blatty found himself gripped by the young boy's tale of possession and exorcism. This macabre saga was perfect material for the work he envisioned. Over the years, as Blatty penned his novel, the eerie details of Roland's ordeal seeped into the fabric of the narrative. The character of Reagan McNeil was born, a parallel to Roland Doe, an innocent besieged by demonic possession. Blatty's writing was as much a journey into the dark recesses of fear as it was an exploration of faith and the power of good over evil. In 1971, his novel was released under the title The Exorcist. The public was instantly captivated, drawn to the chilling tale and the questions it provoked about the supernatural and spiritual warfare. But the tale was not confined to the pages of a book. Soon, Hollywood saw the cinematic potential in the horror-laden narrative. The screen adaptation of The Exorcist, released in 1973, shook the very foundations of horror cinema. Audiences around the globe were confronted with the now iconic head-spinning, green vomit-spewing, terror-inducing portrayal of possession, immortalizing Roland's harrowing ordeal in the annals of pop culture. Though the haunting had ceased for Roland, the world was just beginning to feel the chilling echoes of his terrifying experience. In the shadow of the silver screen's horrific portrayal, the tale of Roland Doe has continued to both fascinate and divide. Skeptics question the validity of the reported possession and the subsequent exorcisms, citing the human mind's capacity for manipulation and the effect of societal and religious influence on the young, impressionable Roland. On the other hand, believers in the supernatural argue that Roland's case stands as one of the most compelling pieces of evidence for demonic possession. Their stance is bolstered by the numerous eyewitness testimonies and detailed reports from highly respected individuals of the clergy who were directly involved in the exorcism rituals. The very word exorcism conjures images heavily influenced by Roland's story. Its impact is far-reaching and it has shaped modern perception of the concept. Today, it's hard to separate the image of the exorcist from the figure presented in Blatty's novel and its film adaptation, the fearless warrior of faith standing against an embodiment of pure, supernatural evil. But beneath the sensationalized media portrayal, the story of Roland Doe offers a more nuanced picture of exorcism. It prompts a deep exploration of faith, the battle between good and evil, and the thin line that exists between the natural and the supernatural. As the spectral curtain descends on these haunting narratives, we find ourselves standing at the crossroads of belief and skepticism. The perception of demonic possession has undergone an intriguing metamorphosis throughout history, shifting from widespread acceptance to cautious speculation and outright denial. Today, science and rationality challenge the validity of such cases, demanding proof beyond personal testimony and historical records. From within the stalwart walls of the Vatican, the Catholic Church maintains a balanced perspective on exorcism. It neither encourages sensationalism nor dismisses the possibility of demonic influences outright. Exorcism rituals are still performed, but only after thorough scrutiny and when all conventional explanations have been exhausted. Across the divide, mental health professionals often interpret cases of alleged possession through the lens of psychology. Symptoms that once signified the presence of demons are now associated with diagnosable conditions such as schizophrenia, epilepsy, or even intense psychological trauma. Yet despite the scientific explanations, these stories continue to clutch at our collective fear. The terror lies not in the monstrous images or violent manifestations, but in the unknowable, the unexplainable, the unseen. It thrives on the age-old human fear of what lurks in the shadows, beyond the reach of our understanding. Popular culture has gleefully embraced these fears, weaving them into the fabric of the horror genre. From cinematic masterpieces to spine-chilling novels, the theme of demonic possession continues to captivate audiences, providing fertile ground for the imagination to conjure horrifying scenarios. 
As we retreat from the chilling luminescence of these tales, we are left with more questions than answers. The haunting accounts of Annalisa Michel, the Smurl family, and Roland Doe remain scarred into our collective psyche. These narratives not only dredge up our deepest fears, but also unsettle our grasp of reality. When the line between the physical and spiritual planes becomes an indiscernible blur, we find ourselves standing at the precipice of an abyss of uncertainties and mysteries. The nightmarish tales of possession have ended, but the creeping dread they leave behind lingers, a spectral presence hovering at the edges of our comprehension, ever ready to plunge us back into the unfathomable darkness from whence they emerged.